Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Session 2 Personal Feedback Presentation, Jesus gives personal feedback regarding experimenting with God's existence and codependent addictions between parents and children which appear to be pleasurable to both parties. Recorded on the 9th of March, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, well, um, we now come to the personal feedback uh, portion of our, of our two days of our sessions. And I've basically chosen, and you can stay in your seats for those of you who have chosen to answer for the personal feedback session. I might get enough time to do this. There's three of you that I've chosen, but David, you're one of them. But I might not get to you depending on how fast I get to the other two. Is that all right? And one of them is Saoirse, who's next to you, so that's uh, handy. And the other one is, is Jada. Where is he? Is he here? He is here. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's here. Right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay. He, he delayed his arrival intellectually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I'll definitely answer your question. And then I'd like to have a chat with the group. Uh, the group feedback after that all right so we'll do the group feedback we'll do a half an hour with this and then and then go on to that okay um now Saoirse I'd probably like to start with you if that's okay with you um could you just if you can you've got the mic down there with you awesome awesome you should just remember to hold it up nice and tight for you now Saoirse asked a, a very good question that the majority of you should ask <laughs> but the majority of you think you don't need to ask it so you, you haven't asked it but very simple question why am i unwilling to experiment to find out whether god exists so why am i unwilling to experiment to find out whether god exists very good question the majority of the planet exactly the feeling that they have not not wanting to find out so what, what I need to ask you, Saoirse, is a few questions um, relating to your family, all right? And in particular, how, how or what your family believes. So can you tell me what your family believes? Uh, I come from a few generations of atheists. All right, so you've had multi-generational atheists, so put that down. Now, of course, if, if somebody else could write down, I've got multi-generational Muslim or multi-generational Christian or multi-generational, couldn't they? It's like there are all these different multi-generational things. So, so it's very good that it, you've also sit, written down or said multi-generational. So it's, uh, okay, and because that that actually does play a part in the feeling you have. So we'll talk about why in a minute. Yes, so what else? Um, so how would they react if all of a sudden Saoirse believed in God? What, what, what would be their reaction uh, as a guess? You know? I've thought about it a lot and right. I'm not exactly sure. It wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be positive. I actually had to tell my mum. Well, I didn't have to. Felt. But you felt you'd had to. Yeah, yeah I did want to. Yeah. Even I was terrified. Um, told my mum a couple of days ago. That you were coming here. Yeah. yeah. And she goes. Yeah, I felt a lot of resistance and kind of fear in her and yes. disbelief. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if we can just write down some of those things in the family. So we've got uh, disbelief in the family that you even, uh, even like even experimenting with the concept, right? Uh, fear, yep. And what was the third one you said? Disbelief, fear and resistance, yes. That's right. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so here's here's Sorsha. Soul. Yeah. Let's let's do it more more realistically. So we draw 
feminine half of the soul, um, unless I'm mistaken. <laughs> Please tell me if I'm mistaken. <laughs> okay, so so we've got feminine half of the soul. You got you know, you know under the you got physical body, spirit body connected to this feminine half of the soul. So there's there's Sorsha. We we'll just put that uh, that character is Sorsha. Okay, and what pressure, pressures has she got upon her before she even considers this question? So you can see you've got the, the family-based pressures projected at you. So th this, is a, this is a emotional pressure being projected at you straight away, right? That's not how you spell pressure. Yes, yes it is. Okay. <laughs> so it looked wrong, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, so you've, got multi you've also got multi-generational pressures. Now, now, every person who's ever died passes and they carry on their current belief systems after they pass. So if you've had multi-generational atheists in your family, then it's highly likely that these particular people are still in spirit, uh, are in spirit and still projecting their beliefs at you. So, so now you've got some spirit-based pressure. So you've got... This is earth-based pressure, people on earth that are pressurising you. And then you've got spirit-based pressure on you as well. People who can actually just drop thoughts into your mind even uh, uh, without you seeing that they're there. Whereas here you've got to go and visit your mum and she drops those thoughts into your mind. Here these spirits can just drop those thoughts into your mind because you, you can't see them and, and, and fairly open to receiving from them. And the thought is basically that the thought is that the atheist viewpoint is the truth as well, right? That's what they believe. All right, so now we've got a definition of truth that has entered you, right? And that the generational, from all sort, from your family for generations have believed to be true. You've got the same, those same generations who have passed who still believe the same thing. So they are putting that on you and then you've got the feelings or pressures from your family on earth now these pressures are going to be quite high right these family based pressures are going to be quite high now can you see already that Sorsha to even experiment with the concept that God exists has to already take some risks that potentially might have quite bad outcomes Right, and 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 yet at this stage, there's not much feeling of the benefit of taking the risk. Do you follow? Because because we we've not yet had the relationship with God, and therefore we've not yet felt the benefit of a relationship. And yet all of these terrible risks are facing me before I even can can engage the experiment. Does that make sense? And this is why it's hard for you to engage the experiment. Um, if you imagine for a moment that you, didn't, you, that you felt quite confident that you weren't get, going to get any family pressure and you felt quite confident that the spirits around you wouldn't you know, disagree with you all the time and also you felt that while you might believe that, uh, you know, in the atheist belief that it, it's an option that you could give it up or, or, or change your viewpoint depending on what truth you discover then you could see that engaging the experiment would be probably quite easy but because of these uh, external pressures um, it's going to be quite hard and and this is quite and the reason why I wanted to raise it not just with you but with many uh, of the others is that is that we don't realize that a lot of our decisions are actually condemned before we even begin the experiment like a lot, like we can't, it's almost like we're not allowed to make a mistake because if we make a mistake, we're just going to get hammered before we begin, right? And this is a major problem with learning. The, the, the problem, if you put a child in an environment where it's going to get hammered if it believes a certain thing, it's highly likely that child will not believe that thing just in order to get acceptance from its surrounds. So, Sorsha, obviously it's going to mean dealing with a few emotions before you begin the experiment. And that's quite hard, actually, because, because 
to deal with those emotions requires already a confrontation of family-based issues which you don't feel there's a, ne a necessarily a positive outcome for before you even begin. And, and this is why beginning is the hardest thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it's a very valid question, but, but that's the main reason why you don't want to engage the experiment. And the, you know the feeling that came over you, that emotion I ca that came over you when I said it's going to be quite hard considering these things, that you, know, you could have, if, we, if you were alone, you could have cried about that, right? That, that's, that's an indication that you know that already. And that's the thing that's stopping you allowing yourself to feel wow i might be confronting my whole family situation here you know my family might reject me they might put huge amounts of pressure on me put huge amounts of pressure on my you know beginning relationship because you're just you know like four months or five months in is that right or six months oh one and a half years sorry <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're one and a half years into a relationship, and, and you know they might put pressure on that relationship, and, and so forth. You don't know what they're going to do at this stage. It's unpredictable, right? Yeah. And that's why. So, so what happens then is the action that needs to be taken, which is the most logical action to do, which is like at least go through the experiment, at least work out whether it's true or not. That action. So, what what Sorsha is considering is an action that actually flies in the face of a lot of opposition right and the problem with such actions are that unless we can see a positive benefit for doing it it's highly unlikely we will probably do it right and and but but one thing you must consider Sorsha, and it's pretty hard to consider this is people who love you will demonstrate their love for you, whether they're atheists or not, will demonstrate their love for you by their treatment of you. And if your family did decide to treat you badly just because you're engaging in an experiment that they don't believe in, then that's an indication that perhaps you've never been loved by them. And that's the thing you're very afraid of discovering. Does that make sense? That's the thing you're afraid of discovering. And that's the fear of the discovery of that causes us to avoid taking what could be in the end action that benefits our entire life and also their lives. You know what I mean? And that's one main reason why we avoid those kind of actions. Yeah. So it's a big thing. Uh, I understand it's a big thing. And the reason why I also raised it for many of the others is many of you are still taking actions that is only to please the people around you and has nothing to do with what you know to be the truth or know to be loving or know to be in your own benefit. So many of you are choosing to do that. Now, for Saoirse, it's different because she's only just begun to sort of conceive the experiment. But you guys, many of you have had years to conceive the experiment or to try the experiment, and yet you're still doing that. So you're still making compromises between your relationship with people on Earth and your relationship with God. Sooner or later, you, you will give up that process if you want to have a relationship with God. All right. So, like I've had to do that, Sorsha, that process. Uh, my, uh, very few members of my family talk to me anymore, and uh, um, uh, for for different reasons. Yeah, some some because they're upset because I told them the truth about something. Some because they're upset about what I'm claiming. Some because they're upset about what I'm doing. Um, you know, teaching other people what what I'm teaching them, and so forth. And. You know, as a result, uh, I barely see any family members now. My, there's, and one of my sons has is Tristan. He's in. He, he he's sort of following God's way, but but no one else in my family is at this point. And and the amount of pressure that was brought to bear, quite significant. You know, when I say significant, there was a point in time where all of my family refused to even see me or speak to me for a period of time. And that was pretty hard like, to deal with. I had to deal with a lot of emotion going through that process. And it's sad. I find it's quite sad, really, that you have to do that. Because if people were just open-minded, you could just experiment with anything, couldn't you? 
Anything that's in it that you feel might be loving, you could experiment with it, find out the answer, and away you go. And, and this is why the world itself isn't changing very rapidly, because there's so many external pressures on us to not experiment. So many. We can't make a mistake when we experiment. So we, and we can't do something what they believe is wrong without being ridiculed or laughed at or even attacked or even abused and sometimes violently. You know, and this is why progress on the earth has been so slow. Because it's the family, the family feelings that make our progress slow. We always go back to conforming. <coughs> In the pageant messages... Now I think it was Luke or John gave a message about why is it, I think the question that he raised at the beginning was why is it that um, families believe what they believe? And at the beginning of the message he says the reality is the majority of families have no idea what, why they believe what they believe because they've just accepted the viewpoint of the family. So the Muslim begets a Muslim, the atheist begets an atheist, the Christian begets a Christian. And, and, and the reason why it usually remains that way for generation after generation is because everyone's too afraid to challenge the previous generation. Yeah. So it is a fear that needs to be addressed if you want to experiment with anything, let alone with the issue with God. Yeah. So does that help as to why? Yes, thank yeah. you. So it's fairly clear emotionally, you can feel that emotionally. So now it's just a matter of working through either working, choosing to work through those emotions and still taking the action or deciding not to take the action and put it off. And, and that's really up to yourself as to what you choose to do there. Yeah. Yeah. My suggestion would be to not put it off, but, but that's, up to, that, that's my suggestion. Um, I've gone through the same experience in two lives <laughs> so um so i understand the pressures and uh you know unfortunately the way our families are generally constructed the pressures are fairly much unavoidable until they realize that you've done the right thing and uh and the sad thing of that is is it's dependent upon you doing the right thing so the trouble with an experiment is you don't know whether you're right or wrong and and you're not allowed to even be wrong without, you know, people attacking you for it sort of thing. So I, I sort of feel like what would be really lovely is if we all allowed ourselves to make mistakes and we all allowed everyone else to make mistakes. And if the mistake is just a simple thing as discovering a, a truth through a process of experimentation, then we should all be allowed to make those experiments, which God actually does allow us to do. It's just our families generally that don't. And society puts also extra pressure on as well yeah yeah okay is there anything you'd like to ask about that no it's pretty clear good uh um so go do straight to david actually because he's next year so we'll do that this will be fairly fast david so <laughs> i said i feel like my willingness to feel my own emotions is my greatest block to the way is this true if so, why don't I want to feel when I've experienced the benefits in the past? If it's not true, then what is my greatest block? So you're hedging your bets either way there. I always do that. Yeah. Um, which is one reason why you're struggling to feel emotion, actually. But um, your primary problem is still your addictions with women. This uh, shuts you down quite intensely. And, um, and as a result of that... See, see, if you don't remove addictions, you won't expose emotion. The, the, the point, if we can just sort of discuss briefly the point of addiction. Because remember, if we have an addiction inside of ourselves, there's usually a point to it. There's a reason for it, right? And um, this is the main issue you face, is that, is that you're using your relationship with women to, to suppress emotion which actually is not beneficial to your relationship either. But this is what you're doing. So, so, so here you are. Well, let's draw you the other way because I just drew Saoirse this way. So I'll draw you this way. Right. <laughs> a bit, bit thin, but anyway. We'll... So again, you've got 
uh, physical body. Better do that first. Spirit, body, soul. So there's the character of David. Okay. Now in David's soul, there's a feeling that worth has to come from the sexual expression of women. Uh, do you understand what I mean by that? Uh, yeah. Uh, this was set up because of, again, your upbringing and how you were brought up. You have had uh, women in, in when you were a child basically uh, in an uh, emotionally incestuous relationship with you. So I'm talking about adult women in an emotionally incestuous relationship with you. So now your worth is established by having sexual expression from women. So you need this sexual expression from a woman in order to gain worth. So... so what, what's going to happen under these circumstances is the more you engage a relationship, unless you address this particular emotion, the more you engage a relationship, the more suppressed you're going to feel emotionally. Does that make sense? Because the addiction is getting met. So when you meet an addiction, so if there's an addiction, and you meet it, addiction, when you meet the addiction, it makes the soul-based feeling feel satisfied. If the soul-based feeling is satisfied, the emotion that the, is the whole, if you like, the, the thing that's void, um, feels like it's getting filled up. And therefore, you're not going to find yourself feeling emotion as a result. Now, many of your emotional addictions are relating to this particular issue, so that means that a lot of your emotion is going to sh get shut down using this method, right? You'll also eventually exhaust a woman with your sexual demands. Right? Does it make sense to you? Does it make any sense? Yeah, no, it Is it what's makes happening? Sense. Yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely what's happening. Yeah. The problem with interacting with you sexually from a woman's perspective who doesn't want this is that she will feel like the only reason why you want her is for the sex. The only reason why you want her, you're not sort of valuing her. Or she will feel like she will have a codependent addiction, which is she needs the man to have this sexual desire for her in order for her to be validated. One of those two things will be happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Now, um, that is the major reason why um, your emotions aren't flowing. Yep. And because your addictions are getting met, there's no need for the emotions to flow because you already feel they're all getting satisfied and it also helps you become almost unaware of the emotions. Yep. So that's related. Well, I've felt this sort of feeling of contentness lately, like you know, there's no drive to go forward because I've hit this Correct. You're getting your addictions met. There's no need to challenge it. Obviously, Sorsha is meeting you at some of these addictions. There's no need to challenge it. You feel if you challenge it, you challenge the relationship, which... Possibly is true, but it depends on Sorsha's feelings about that as to how much the relationship is challenged. But, but you feel quite content and a, as a result. And there's also not any drive to continue your own progression under those circumstances. So when there's no drive to continue our own progression, it's usually because our addictions are being satisfied. It's, it's when our addictions are no longer satisfied that we start to have a drive to progress again. Now, you can do that in a relationship, but you've only ever done it outside of a relationship up until now. Mm. So the only times you've ever progressed up until now, up until before you began a relationship with Sorsha, the only time you ever progressed was when you weren't in a relationship and the addictions weren't getting met. Mm. And therefore you felt some pain and therefore the need to change. And, and this, is, this demonstrates an actual underlying issue too, my friend. And that is that while it demonstrates a, a fair degree of selfish, selfishness in a way, in the sense that I'm only going to progress while I'm in pain, as soon as my pain stops, I stop progressing. I've thought about that exact same thing, Yeah, what you said recently. 
Yeah. Now that's an indication that it's only the pain that drove you to progress in the first place. Yeah, there was a fair bit there. Yeah. So, so what happens for the majority of us, we're in some pain, that motivates some progression, but as soon as the pain stops, we're no longer motivated to progress. Yeah. And that's an indication that actually it's not about relationship with God. It's actually about relationship with our pain and the avoidance of it. You follow? So, so your actual, so your relationship with God hasn't really begun in some ways, right? So maybe Saoirse, your question, <laughs> Saoirse should have asked that question for you too, because because in a lot of ways, you've only progressed up until this point because of the desire for a relationship with a woman, not because I want a relationship with God. Yes, yep, yep. So what I need to go back and look at really is. The where I've developed that you know need for getting my worth from yep. a woman, like yeah. that relationship with my mum and yep. other, other women when I was a child. Yeah, you know what your mum's like. Yeah, um, I'm sure sure she even now is know now knows what her, she's like and the hooks that mum has into you. Do you find Sorsha? Do you mind me asking? Do you feel a bit jealous of his relationship with mum sometimes, or or do you sort of just tolerate the the investment that he has in it no i i don't feel jealous yeah. um i haven't really thought about it you know the main reason why we don't is because is because there's almost this thing on the planet that a mum's relationship with his son with her son you tolerate that right and the father's relationship with the daughter that's special you, you don't take that away even if you're married to the person do you follow me? And that, that is a big problem in the sense that from God's perspective, the two halves are meant to join together and that needs to be the primary relationship, right? And, and yet most, for most of us, the primary relationship remains the relationship with, between mother and son. So this is, this is the mother. Between mother and son and between the, daughter, the daughter's father and herself. And so when these two get together, and I'm not suggesting these are the same parents, these are different parents, obviously, um, what happens is you can see what starts playing out, a lot of things playing out in, in the relationship, right? And, and it's very, very confusing when it comes to problems being solved in the relationship because, because there's the, to, in order for these two people to be together, this person must tolerate this relationship, and this person must tolerate this relationship. And when I say tolerate, I mean view it as important, like view it as important as the, usually the parents view it. And uh, it's quite damaging to a soulmate relationship, actually, to do that. You, you want to, the primary person in your relationship, you want to be the other half, you know, not mummy or daddy. Yep. So for yourself, Dave, that's an issue that you face. Now, in some place, times you've in the past you've rebelled against it. You know you feel, and and that's what's driven you to drugs in the past and so forth. This deep level of sadness that you have with your mum and and the oppression that you feel actually from her. But unfortunately, there's this aspect of worth that's in, hooked into the problem. So so now instead of getting your worth met from mum, you find a a lady who you can get your worth met through. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Which brings me to Jada. There is the man. He is here now. Yes. Yeah. He's all here now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now Jada's question, I'll just find it. Analyzing my actions is showing me how much I am sinning towards women. Jada, can you be a bit more specific? Um, yeah, like sexual actions. Yeah. Um, so you go from one woman to another woman and so forth? Yeah. Yeah. If you just hold the mic up a yeah. bit closer. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and do you often have two on the toe at the same time? Or is this is just one, like serial monogamy, is it? Or It's more like... Even worse, like not even relationships, more like 
um, brief encounters, getting like a massage um, of, of sexual nature. Yeah. So it's like briefings, brief like encounters. A, yeah. 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 I get you. Okay. You, I, I'm sorry. I just needed to yeah, yeah. ask. I, I've felt there's a bit more you could tell, but but I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, you say, yet I am still finding it very difficult to feel any wrongdoing from my from my mum towards me. How do you find like, how do you find a problem when you feel there isn't any? Right. So it's a very good question. Well, fir firstly, we need to see here that actually your definition, you're, like you're being driven by the pain and pleasure question. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're not being driven by a desire for truth or a, desi or, or a desire for love, but rather you're just driven by what's going to give me pain, what's going to give me pleasure. I'm going to go for the pleasure. So, so whatever it, ta it takes, even if I sin from God's perspective, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So the first problem is the lack of developed will to love. Does that make sense? So here's your soul. You're making a choice between pain and pleasure. And you're deciding that the pleasure is the thing to go for. It doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter what it costs the other person. It doesn't matter what it costs you. And your reasoning is along the lines of, well, if the other person knows the cost they're engaging, then what's going wrong? There's nothing yep. wrong. That's, That's what I've been feeling recently. Yeah, yeah. but you're not realising that there's another half to your soul. Yeah. And every time, so here's the two halves. Every time your half, so this is you, engages with another woman sexually, you're really damaging this relationship, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. So you're actually damaging yourself <laughs> in the process. So that you, there's a lot of truth that you need to come to become aware of in this process. Mm -hmm. So there's an avoidance of truth, number one. You don't want to accept God's truth about the issue. You also don't want to face the moral issues involved with it. Does that make sense for the people who you're engaging sexually? So if a person, if you engage another woman sexually, mm -hmm. she also has a soulmate. You're not seeing how you're sinning against that relationship. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a whole heap of truth that needs to be looked at there. From I feel like in my head, I, like I've known that and I know that. Yeah, but you don't feel it. No. And it's only how you feel that drives your actions. Yeah. What, what you know makes no difference, right? Yeah. So, so we're, we're, I'm talking here always from the soul-based soul perspective, so from the feeling-based perspective here. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter what you know here. What matters is how you feel here. And how you basically feel is that your actions are justified. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now let's trace this back, this this particular process back in terms of belief. What is your relationship with your mother? Um, <laughs> probably a lot closer than it should be. And <laughs> when you say a lot closer, then can you? <laughs> like I've, I've, um, like I was living at home until. Till like, what age? Probably, I can't remember exactly. Probably twenty one, twenty two, or something. Yep. And it's still quite like I still. Um, go to my parents' place weekly, really, for like one or two days. Yep, and what's your relationship with your mother in comparison to your relationship with your father? Uh, my father left when I was five. Yep. So So you were in a single parent household for a lot of... Yep, I've had a few stepdads during A few stepdads time. in my time, but... Yeah. So, so can you see that your mother sees you as her surrogate husband? Yep. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. Which she does do, doesn't she? Really? Yes. She, yep. you're, you're the person that she sees as her, her main man. Yeah. Yep. Now what this done, so here's you, and, and dad's sort of, sort of like now out of the picture. Mum's now got this relationship with you where everything that's now missing in her relationships with men, she now projects onto you. And you're her main man. In that process, she has actually taught you to abuse women. Isn't that interesting? She's basically telling you in this process that you are the ideal man. And she pretty much thinks that, doesn't she? I have a f yeah, I have that feeling, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, she pretty much thinks that, that you are the ideal man. Mm -hmm. Now, now... Jada grows up to be an adult. 
he now believes he's the ideal man. Right? You're pretty confident with yourself with women, aren't you? That I wouldn't... That... I have trouble with that. Yeah. I feel like I've had um, a lot of insecurities and... Yeah, but in the end, you do believe yeah. that, that women are there for your sexual pleasure, do you not? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 So this is sort of an extension of the issue that I raised with David in, a, in some ways. Yeah, I was feeling a lot. Yeah, your mum's, your mum's got this quite emotionally incestuous relationship with you. Mm -hmm. And instead of you rebelling against that like David has... And then, you know, he felt quite sad about it, the oppression, and, he, and he's, he's turned to drugs in the past in order to suppress the, the sadness and so forth. Instead of doing all that, you enjoy how your mum sees you. Mm -hmm. You saw it, follow? Yeah. Yep. And you're very reticent to give up this relationship with your mum. Yeah. What do you get out of it? You tell me. You get a fair bit. Yeah. Both emotionally and physically. Yeah, looked after. And so what do you get physically? Um, like how many, how many meals do you have to pre prepare when you go around the mum? <laughs> yeah. Have um, you ever prepared a meal <laughs> around a mum's? Oh, I do, yeah. I For her? For her? No. No, never. okay. So, so you get all your meals on tap. Yeah. All right, so you get your meals. Yeah. What else? Do, do, have you ever had to wash your mum's clothes? No. Never? No. Yeah, interesting. I was washing my mum's clothes when I was five. Yeah. Okay. So you never had to do that, so you get a laundry person mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. How do you spell laundry? R-Y or A-R-Y? R-Y. R-Y, okay. Laundry person, okay. What else do you get? What um, feelings do you get from her? Yeah, like you're saying, like I'm a good, a good guy. You're a good guy. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're the ideal guy. So I yep. get that feeling from her, even if no other woman thinks that she does, right? Yeah. So, so now there's this codependency that's built up between yourself and your mother, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're, dip you like a lot of the things she gives you. She likes a lot of the things you give her. In fact, she educated you through your life to give her those things, right? And both of you like the relationship because you get what you want out of it and she gets what she wants out of it. So the, the big problem is that, uh, what else do you get emotionally? Let's talk about emotionally. If, if you've got a problem, who do you take it to? Yeah, I'll take it to her. Take it to mum, yeah. yeah. So, so there's an emotional mm -hmm. bond mm -hmm. which allows you to have a degree of emotional intimacy. So you have some emotional intimacy with mum, yes? Yeah, it also feels cold as well. Well, of course, we'll explain yeah. why in a minute, but, but you do do this. Yep. You, you, this is who you share with. Yep. Now, can you see that a lot of your definitions of what a woman should do are tied up in this? Mm -hmm. and, and really, if you're getting all of these things from, in, in, and particularly some emotional intimacy and so forth from your mum, what's the point of having emotional intimacy with any other woman? There's not much point, is there? Mm. So what's the only thing missing in your relationship with mum? The sexual. Sex. Mm. That's the only thing missing. Mm -hmm. So what do you choose to do with that? You find Fine. another woman yeah. to supply the thing that's missing in your relationship with your mother. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. And this is why you don't see that there's anything wrong with the whole process. Because you're getting a whole heap of things that you want. She's getting a whole heap of things she wants. Mm -hmm. And the bit that's not there, the bit that's missing, you go and use another woman for. Whether that be a one night stand or a massage or whatever. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. mm. That's the answer to your question. That's what's really going on. Now, even in this discussion, you're very resistive to it. Very resistive. <laughs> yeah. 
Can you feel it? Can you feel? Because what I'm basically suggesting mm. to you mm -hmm. is that if you are ever going to progress towards God, and if you're ever going to progress towards love and truth, you're going to have to give up this very incestuous relationship with your mother, which means giving up a whole heap of things that you find quite nice mm -hmm. and quite good. And, and your mum will be confused as well in the process because she thinks she, like, both of you are happy. Why are you doing this for? So she's going to be ultra confused about you doing it as well. Do you understand? Yeah. Now, this is a problem with emotionally incestuous relationships with children. What's happening, what happens is we frequently, when this relationship between our partner and ourselves does not work and we have children, we then put the burden of supplying whatever our partner did not supply onto our children. So in your case, the partner's not supplying some emotional intimacy, so I get it from Jada. So mum gets it from Jada. Partner's not supplying some, you know, male, masculine sort of emotion and feeling. Get that from Jada. And, and after a while, the parent sets up this relationship where the child now thinks that that's the ideal parent-child relationship. The problem is, is that it damages our concept of the opposite gender quite severely to the point where we believe that this is actually, this codependent addiction with our mothers is, is actually a good thing. Or, by the way, this happens with girls with their fathers, right? Same, same issue. You see a lot of fathers can't confide with their wives. So what do they do when they have a ch girl child? They confide in the child, the girl. She learns that she's really the surrogate emotional support for father. And the same kind of thing gets established. And so what does the girl need then? The only thing, if she wants sex, the only thing is she can't have sex with dad. So find another man to have sex with and dad doesn't really care who she has sex with as long as dad's the primary focus emotionally of her life as soon as dad stops being the primary focus emotionally of her life dad goes into a major meltdown because he wants to be the primary focus that's what he created he wants her to remain the same your mum's going to go into a big meltdown once you confront this once you confront this because mm -hmm. she's not going to confront it first by the way okay she won't and you at this stage have no desire to confront it, right? which is the reason why you engage in sexual activity with women without seeing the problem with it. Mm -hmm. You follow? Yep. Mm. And it's, um, Ask away. Yeah, just with... I've just noticed as well that I've, I'm viewing God and when I'm trying to... I feel praying, but I'm, it's obviously all in my head and stuff. This is what I've come to work out. Mm -hmm. um, but even that, God seems like a, like a man, like very male to me. Mm -hmm. And is it, like, Which I is the reason why you struggle with the relationship, right? With God. Yeah. Is that, yeah okay. Yep. Yeah, because the, the belief is that God's a male, but, but you know, you've had no emotional, much emotional energy from a man in authority, a man that's you know, in a, older than you or anything like that because of the breakdown of relationship with dad. And as a result, you can't even really emotionally connect to the concept no. at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Definitely affecting your relationship with God. And then, of course, uh, the addiction with the women and the actual treatment of women means that you can't have a relationship with the feminine side of God either. So, so both parts of the relationship are interfered with here. Does that make sense? So part of it's going to be able to feel the pain associated with the lack of relationship with your father. And the other part is to break down this codependent addiction with your mother. Um, but, but you are going to struggle with the desire to do so. I'm funny how with, um, like I feel like with my dad, like to me that was obvious that there was love withdrawn mm -hmm. with mum i feel like yeah she's looked after me at least yeah you feel she loves you yeah your definition of love is this is what a mother does yeah yeah no that's not true god is also a mother and god doesn't do this in fact what god does is god wants you to stand on your own two feet does that make sense so so the reality is this kind of relationship with a parent is actually out of harmony with god's love um, but many people engage it because it's codependently satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as a truth, that's pretty hard to accept, right? 
Yeah. And what I'm basically saying is that is that the Jada does not have a desire to address the problems that have associated with it. But once you start to accept the truth from God's perspective, what will happen, Jada, is you'll start seeing, wow, this is probably one of the worst things that could happen to me, actually, to have this kind of relationship. Because it actually severely damages a relationship with the other half of yourself, your, your soulmate. Not only that, it has severely affected how you see yourself. You are very dependent. Your worth is very tied up with your mother's opinion of you. And if, you'll find that if you, if you do try to change this relationship with mum, your mum is going to go into a meltdown. And you know that, like she is going to go into a meltdown. And in the process of going into a meltdown, she might say and do things to you, to you that really make you feel like, wow, my mum doesn't care about me at all, right? And that's going to really challenge your own concept of self. So your issue of worth is tied up into this relationship as well. And that's why it's going to be a very difficult thing to break for you. Does that make yeah. sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. But essential if you ever want to be, if you ever want to have even a decent marriage or a decent partnership with a woman at any time, unless you address this problem, you will not have one. You, you will live the rest of your life without one, probably. Unless that woman tolerates this very emotionally incestuous relationship, you, you won't have a relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is one reason why you don't attract. Uh, you know, you're an attractive enough man and you've, you've got things going for you, but you don't actually attract women in long-term relationships. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So it's actually affecting a lot of your life. Far more than... So, so at some point you're going to have to weigh the cost-benefit, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The pain-pleasure. At this stage you feel, no, the pleasure is more doing this is more than any pain you're getting from it. But at some point, once you start receiving God's truth about the issue, you'll realise actually the pain of what you're doing is far worse, not only now, but long term, than the pleasure you're actually getting from the relationship at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, it's, it's also not good for your mother. Yep. Not good at all. Because it prevents her from having her soulmate relationship as well. I can even see that she's having a strong relationship with her dad, her, my grandfather. Yeah, it's multi-generational, all these problems. Yeah. yeah. So normally what happens when the parents do this is the opposite gender parent is the parent that the previous generation has a relationship with. So with your mother, she has it with her daddy, right, and so forth. And it goes, each switches gender each subsequent generation because of the addiction. And usually the partners can't handle this relationship, you see. Yep. So most men get very jealous in this sort of situation where this woman is mostly concerned about what daddy thinks or feels rather than what he thinks or feels. So eventually this guy leaves, which then means that she's looking for a substitute. Eventually he's going to die, so where does the substitute come from? If she's got a male child, that's going to be the substitute. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Very damaging multi-generational error. Yeah. And just with... Because I have a little brother as well, mm -hmm. half-brother. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, if I can see that... And I know that that's what's going on, because it's happening to me and it's happening with him. Yeah. Where... Yeah. Um, <coughs> do I have a responsibility in that situation to... For my little brother? To well, how can you change something for him when you haven't yet changed it for you? That's a bit, you yeah. know, you wouldn't be able to do that. Sure. But you could, you could actually begin to change it and model some behaviour to him as to what's going on. Okay. You know, it's rare that, um, that all the male boys in a, in a mo with, a, with a mother like your mother would all respond in the same way. So usually... Some of the boys, he, rebe he, he goes into rebellion, and, yeah. And that's, yeah, it's been eye-opening for me to see. Um, so he's doing what David did with his mother. Yeah, it, yeah, to see her. Because I, I didn't feel like I got the anger from her because I was already probably doing 
what she wanted growing exactly, up. Exactly, you were groomed to do so. Yeah. And usually it's the oldest boy or the yeah. oldest girl that's groomed into this process. Yeah. So I've seen, seen him copping the, the anger. Yeah, yeah. And Her anger with men. Yeah. Yeah, and demands on men, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty bad. And, and unfortunately, a lot of older brothers blame their younger brothers for the anger. You know, they say, you just need to do more of what mum wants, just like I do type of thing, which is not the case. What's actually happening is mum's getting triggered. So that's probably what I've been doing already. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. So, so he has the additional burden of feeling like older brother disagrees with his course of action. Yeah. Tricky, hey? Yeah. So, yeah, very, uh, these kind of problems are multi generational or emotional incestuous relationships have a huge, there are, a, like, oh, it's v very rare to not see one on the planet, to be frank. Um, but some are more intense than others, and particularly the relationships where one of the parents has left home. You particularly see it under those circumstances. Where, where there's a breakdown in this relationship, then this relationship gets established quite intensely. And in fact, many couples wouldn't even stay together unless that happened. Many couples, many of these couples wouldn't even stay together because, because this woman would be so dissatisfied with this relationship that eventually she would leave if she didn't have this relationship. Do you see? So, so what I see is some, some couples have been married 60 years and mum's got an incestuous relationship with old, or oldest or youngest brother. It's usually one of them. And she's developed this incestuous relationship over the years and that's what keeps her in her current relationship as well. She, she doesn't feel any dissatisfaction with the current relationship. The current relationship provides the sexual connection and the relationship here provides all the emotional connection. So she feels satisfied. Does that make sense? Not considering her, the long-term detrimental effects on herself, her partner, or her children, unfortunately. Yeah, so I see a lot of marriages actually stay together only because they've actually had children. Right? That's why there's this belief still on the planet that if you have a child with somebody, you'll stay together longer. <laughs> Because there's actually addictions involved with <laughs> what, what it gives the person, you see. That's why they stay together longer, because they're meeting more of their addictions. Sad, really, huh? Yeah, quite severe issues. Now, how does that relate to the use of our will? Well, when we are, when we are engaged, as you are, Jada, in meeting a lot of your current addictions with another person in a codependent manner, then you won't have a highly developed will to change that unless you really love love and truth. Unless you really love, you know, the right thing, you won't have a high desire to change it. So, so part of this educational process for yourself is learning about what's the right thing, learning about the damage. See the damage to your other, you know, your sibling, to, to your brother. See, see what's really going on and, and see the damage that's being caused, that's a part of the educational process in terms of getting to the point where you now feel motivated to do something about this rather than just live in it, you know? Yep. Now, I raised all of that. Your original question was about the sexual uh, feelings you have towards just women other than your mother. <laughs> and you can see the relationship, can you, between that? The, that You need those women because... because you have sexual desires that can't be fulfilled in this relationship. So you need the other women. And, and your mum needs the occasional stepfather, you know, occasional guy, to satisfy her same desires because she can't get those met through you. And that's why you have transient relationships with others and she also does. Does that make sense? No one permanent. Or semi-permanent generally. You know, stay for a few years, off they go, and so forth. Yep. So you're right with that? You got any more questions? That's all right. No. That's fine. Yep. If we go across to Felix. Um, 
I feel it's a bit similar to me, but I, I am confused with um, some things because I, like, I know when, when I was a kid, I found my mum was very, like, always really, like, fearful and angry and um, I kind of hated it, t- didn't, did not like it. Yeah. Um, but then, then later on when I was a teenager, she changed. And, like, just with my, my sexual addictions um, and stuff, I've noticed a lot of them, you know, come down to um, how I feel about – or, yeah, how – um, my feelings towards my mum, yeah, and and um, just what I felt a man should be like and stuff, yeah. Um, but I'm I'm kind of confused about the rest of it. I, I just know like challenging my addictions, I do need to feel my. Felix, can I Sorry. not answer your question? I just want to say briefly yep. about it because um, I feel I've answered the question here with Jada. What I want to say to you is everyone has various degrees of this usually. Yep. Okay. So, so it just depends on how what was unsatisfied within the parent yep. okay. as to what gets projected at the child. Yep. So, so the reality is for your mum, yes, she does have a lot of fear. So that gets projected at the child. Now you rebelled against the fear, right? And then when mum no longer has the fear or, or is now managing her fear differently, mm. you feel a bit more attracted to have a relationship with her. Does that make sense? It just depends on what happens in the circumstance or situation. The key for each person is to analyse it for themselves yep, okay. and ask themselves what bits out of harmony would love here and what bit is yep. in harmony, what bit's addiction, what bit is real. And, and what I'm suggesting to you is... The majority of relationships between parents and children have damage in them and a large portion of them are not actually real. They are based upon codependent addictions getting met by the child for the parent. So the parent approves of the child as long as the child does what the parent expects. Mm -hmm. As soon as the child no longer does what the parent expects, then the parent no longer approves of the child. So that's not love. A person who truly loves, loves you no matter what you choose. Does that make sense? That's how God is. God loves the people even in the hells who have chosen a lot of badness. God still loves them and God loves the people who are good. It doesn't matter either way what they choose. God still loves them. They can't all feel God's love, but God still loves them. God doesn't change love based upon what we choose. Our parents do. And when our parents do that, then it's not love. And we need to recognise it as not being love. Does that make sense? Yeah. And feel about it, not being love as well. Yeah. Can I uh, move off of this topic? Because I want to have a discussion about a group, a group discussion with you, actually. Jada, are you going to let that settle with you? That'd be good. That'd be good. Can't continue harming these women, mate. You end up in a pretty bad condition in the spirit world if you do. There's, uh, one, there's one statement in the Paget messages which is very interesting. And when, when James Paget asked his wife who had passed, he said to her, what, what persons do you find in the worst condition in the spirit world? And she said, suicides and prostitutes. And then she said... The people who are prostitutes weren't prostitutes on earth. They have become so in the spirit world because of their desire only for sexual interaction and their sexual addictions. And the reason why she said that was the worst situation is because she found them the hardest to talk to and the hardest to move off of their addiction. Does that make sense? And that, if you think about it, it sort of makes sense with regard to those particular th- things. We'll talk about suicide separate, but, but if you think about the prostitute, sexual, the sexual feelings inside of us generally are quite strong motivators, are they not? And quite strong motivators towards pleasure, if we're connected with pleasure. And, and, and if we become addicted to them in any way, you can see that it almost becomes like a frenzy after that. And that, and that is going to cause a lot of problems with your, with your logical ability to be able to determine what is right and what is wrong and actually do it. So, so they are quite serious issues. Um, the suicide is, uh, is very similar too because they don't recognise their rage. Most people who suicide, suicide because they're actually angry and they blame the world for their anger and they can't, they're in a frenzy doing that as well, so much to the point where they're able to, you know, suicide. And this is one of the reasons why they're very difficult also to help in the spirit world. 